This episode is brought to you by the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. A beloved Denver tradition, DCPA's production of A Christmas Carol is a holiday classic and an essential must-see for the holiday season. Broadway World calls the show, quote, a splendidly festive tradition for the whole family that illuminates the meaning of the holiday season in a way that has resonated for generations. A Christmas Carol is on stage now through December 24th at DCPA's Wolf Theater. Tickets available at denvercenter.org. That's denvercenter.org. Today on CityCast Denver, why are Denver area Paneras hiding their hottest new menu item behind the counter? Will Denverites rally to save our last car-free streets from angry business owners? And where is the best place to get that one particular type of French fries? We're talking about all the latest food and dining stories, plus our picks for your weekend. Today is Thursday, December 14th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Producer Olivia Jewell Love, good morning. Hey, Bree, how's it going? Good. We're here with executive producer Paul Caroli. Hello. Hey, good morning, Bree. Good morning, Olivia. So, our resident foodie, Peyton Garcia, is out today. Because she's in New York, one of the greatest culinary cities in the world, <laughs> celebrating her birthday. Oh, she's going to be eating pizza. Oh, she's going to be eating so uh, much food. Apples. <laughs> apples. <laughs> not small ones. <laughs> nuts for nuts. My favorite thing, the roasted nuts on the street corner. Those are my favorite. Halal food. Halal mm. carts everywhere. All the things you can't get here. Speaking of roasted nuts on the street corner, yeah. by the way, Olivia, you recommended the Georgetown Christmas Market recently on the yeah. show. I have to yeah. say... I did that last year and I got the roasted chestnuts. I got the, you know, the sure. famous re- chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Terrible. Terrible. I don't know what it ch- <laughs> I do not like that nut. It is so dry and flavorless. Oh. It is not not a fun experience. It's it's really just a little PSA for the holidays. It's just for the song. It's not really for reality, huh? I think so. I like the nuts that are roasted in like Same. cinnamon sugar, butter, yeah. all that that they have at the mall. That's what I'm thinking about. They have that in New York on the street. So good. But we're not talking about (laughs) roasted chestnuts. We're talking (laughs) about killer lemonade. Um, (laughs) Olivia, so (laughs) I'm really setting it up here. Um, But there's there's a lawsuit involving Panera and this charged lemonade. Can you tell us what is going on? (laughs) There's there's two lawsuits. So this is known by the internet as now the lemonade that kills you. Um, Mm -hmm. So the meme is probably dead now that I said that out loud. But in case you saw that, that's what it's called. Um, So there are these caffeinated lemonades that Panera sells. And apparently two separate incidents, two people drank a lot of this caffeinated lemonade and both had underlying heart conditions and tragically passed away from too much caffeine because they drank a lot of this lemonade. And so there the lawsuit is based around the fact that Panera had these lemonades just sitting out with all the rest of their drinks, you know, where you could self-serve. And if you've been to Panera before, they have some pretty big cups. You can you can really supersize your charged lemonade. Olivia, so that's the thing. I mean, I think you're underselling this a little bit. You've been kind of okay. obsessed with this, this over the last <laughs> few weeks. She does talk about you've it You've been a talking lot. about memes. You know, there's a Gen Z factor here. Like, this is this is not just, like, people going and getting a lemonade with this their is sandwich. The this is, like... People going and do stunts, right? Like, isn't that no. isn't that what the trend is? Like, how much no, no, lemonade? No, 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 the, the people, no. the, the people that died were really just trying to. They were, from what I understand, they didn't really under they didn't really read what it was. They didn't really understand that there was that much caffeine in it, and they drank too much, and they had conditions that they shouldn't have been consuming that much caffeine. But since then, since there are lawsuits now, like you know, calling this like a deadly product. People mm-hmm. on the internet have just ran with it as as they do. This drink kills people, but is it actually true? Today we're going to find out. But you're telling me you you talked to some people at Panera's here in Denver and you can no longer get the refills on this charged lemonade anymore? They have some new policy that it's behind the counter? It is behind the counter. They are in charge of serving it to you. Hmm. Do you hear anything else from these the, from the local Panera's? Um, uh, they... 
they seemed very upbeat about still having it. And they haven't had any teens coming in to film their TikTok videos, <laughs> drinking two charged lemonades. There was no like YouTube exposés <laughs> that I could see so far, but yeah. So so I don't know. I when we were at the 16th Street Mall one, it was literally like behind the corner of their cafe. I couldn't even see it. I was like, "Do you still have it?" And they were like, "Yeah, it's it's in the back." That just feels like it. <laughs> It just feels like something to deter young people from asking for something. You know what I mean? Like it's treated like contraband. So, yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. Well, I just want to put this in context to like this seems like a hysteria that has happened over many different kinds of products over time. I'm a child of the 80s and Jolt Cola was also one of these types of like high caffeinated beverages that might be harmful to children or when Pop Rocks were considered too dangerous and they changed the formulation so they weren't so like poppy because you know they couldn't make your stomach explode or something paul do you have any experiences with these did this dangerous food idea dangerous food uh supposedly i i I, yeah i i guess i mean i i was in college when four loco was a big thing (laughs) and uh now's as good a time as any i mean 11 years late to deploy this joke i thought of way back then which was when they took the alcohol out of the four loco because it was allegedly dangerous and killing young people. Um, I said that they should release a new product. They should, two new products. They should have a can of soda called Three Loco and a uh, little five hour energy shot called One Loco. <laughs> and their new slogan should be, You do the math. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Four Loco. So for folks that didn't know, Four Loco was like a energy drink and a malt beverage in one. And uh, Four Loco, right? But not in that same uh, formula. Yeah, but it's not the same anymore. Oh, you. It was the most classic formula. Drunk. It's still it's still considered a very feral beverage. First, that's a great way to describe it. Well, so what I'm thinking with this charged lemonade is, I'm thinking this is the perfect drink to have at Panera. So when you get your bread bowl with a side of bread filled up with some bread-shaped pasta. (laughs) This is the perfect drink to have with it to keep you from going into a bread coma. That's true. Because the caffeine in this will will power you through that amount of carbs. At least for me, that's the math I'm doing. That's my girl math. That that's interesting math. I mean, I, I guess I could speak more from how the company probably is thinking about this. I know a little bit about how this chain restaurant business oh, yeah, you're a works. Big chain just fast you know, casual guy. Being obsessed with Chipotle, always <laughs> thinking about it. But Panera is like is an interesting uh is in an interesting place right now. I mean, like many of them, it's opened by owned by this uh, German conglomerate, but um it's actually doing quite well. Panera is on the rise. Um, they have like 2,000 locations and they are ranked, according to QSR, 11th among fast food chains in terms of yearly revenue. Interesting. And um, they do pretty well per store. So it's a pretty successful brand. But I think where this is coming from, this charged lemonade, is like there's this perception of the Panera brand that it's very kind of you know bland, Stuffy. maybe drab, or as Simpsons writer Bill Oakley says, it's the place you go to break bad news to somebody. <laughs> So I feel like the charged lemonade is like their effort to get in on the like novelty foods of the Doritos Locos Tacos, kind of like get something fresh to get young people in, but also to fit within their, you know, family friendly, old fashioned. It's got a real Baja Blast vibe to it. I see what you're saying. A lot of the uh, more the extreme, Mm -hmm. the extreme uh, aesthetics of the 90s and food, which we were super into. I could see that because I I like Panera for the reason that maybe that joke works, which is like it kind of feels like a library a little bit. And it's yeah. I like that better than a lot of fast casual restaurants, which feel like I'm eating in the kitchen or the restroom of the restaurant. And they this or a construction <laughs> site, as one guy said, described Chipotle <laughs> yeah, to me. Because well, all of the yeah. interior, you know, it's like all of the infrastructure of the buildings exposed, exposed yeah. air ducts. And mm-hmm. Panera is the opposite. So maybe you're you're right, Paul. Maybe they're trying to move away from their buttoned up image and get a little bit more extreme. But did they go too far? This episode is brought to you by the Colfax Avenue Business Improvement District. This holiday season, give the gift of local love with a bag of Colfax. 
Picture this, a gift bag filled with four to six handpicked products from your favorite spots along Colfax Avenue. Places like the Learned Lemur, 303 Boards, and Balanced Root Apothecary, just to name a few. Want the VIP experience? Upgrade to the VIP bag, and your goodies will come packed in a durable tote made from upcycled material from vintage Colfax street banners. How cool is that? While the specific contents of the bags are a mystery, every single bag will have a locally made lavender scented candle that celebrates Denver's queer cultural district, Lavender Hill. Every bag is completely customized. Tell the Colfax Ave team a bit about yourself or the lucky recipient at checkout, and they'll handpick items that they know you'll love. Love surprises? Leave the preferences box blank and embrace the mystery. Head to colfaxav.com to grab your bag of Colfax today. This episode is brought to you by the Museum of Illusions, Denver. Located on the 16th Street Mall at Curtis Street, this museum has over 60 mind-bending illusions that will play with your perceptions and engage your brain. Combining education and entertainment with hyperlocal exhibits, guests can take photos inside a moving tunnel and enter a gravity-defying RTD light rail car. And this holiday season, the Museum of Illusions is bringing Santa. He will be at the museum on December 18th and 19th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to take photos with families and kids. This special event will be included in the price of a regular admission to the museum, and the museum expects to sell out, so don't wait to reserve your tickets. Tickets for specific dates and time slots can be purchased at moidenver.com. That's moidenver.com. Uh, okay, our next topic is closed streets. Um, this is something that Business Den reported on this week, and some business owners and the area people call Rhino are not loving their closed street, which is kind of surprising because the city has been closing streets like Larimer with this idea that it might help businesses. This is sort of a holdover from the pandemic era changes that cities have made. Paul, what's the latest on this program? Yeah. So like you said, this was started in the pandemic, which is kind of funny to think about, you know, this being one of the lingering facts of life. You know, we have this idea to shut down streets to everyone but pedestrians or bikers. And um, I thought it was cool at the time. I mean, now they're quite controversial, it seems. We got these business owners who are disagreeing. Um, the, the program as it stands now, there's only really three places in the city where there are closed streets. There's the block of Larimer where these business owners are. And then the other two are Larimer Square, um, which feels honestly like this is how it always was. I, d I don't even really remember what it was like totally. with cars. And then the, um, the, the couple blocks under the pavilions, you know, the, the walk over that walkway underneath oh, that right. I think is, is closed off between 15th and 17th. Um, it's a temporary program and, uh, it expires at the end of the year, which is, I think why the story was happening is because some of these business owners that support the program in, uh, Rhino, which I will say proudly, um, are, uh, are, are starting a nonprofit to build street enhancements. At the same time, some of these other business owners are like, this is BS. You know, we should not do this anymore. Bring on the cars. Yeah. I, uh, this was the first time I thought of it from the business owner's perspective of it not being helpful. I totally assumed it was I a great too. idea for them, you know, more foot traffic. It's an attraction. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And it seemed like, like, like the thing you said about Larimer, I agree. It feels like it's always been that way. And it seems like the street functions that way already. So it didn't, it didn't seem like it was impacting business. But hearing from these other business owners um, in this section of Larimer much farther down is, it sounds like it's a little bit of a different story. Some folks are saying we don't, mm -hmm. we can't rely on foot traffic. We're the kind of business that people pull up to with their car and pick something up. Um, it's just become more of a nuisance than anything. And, um, but one of the business owners was like, had those strong feelings, but also said, I don't want to start a fight with my fellow business owners. So I think she was trying to figure out a way how mm. they're going to deal with this. And I have to say, it's a tough, it's a tough call. Yeah. I think it might be a fight in the end. I mean, if some people are benefiting a lot and other people are benefiting, not at all, that's just like their interests are opposed. Yeah. Yeah. Olivia, I, you were saying something about this in related to Idaho Springs. Yeah. So when I was a reporter up there, um, Minor Street, which is like their kind of downtown main strip, um, through May through like, I think it in the past they've done May through Halloween, um, they close off that street to cars and they have it, their city council calls it a communal outdoor dining area. And so all their businesses on that street, if they get the like 
liquor licenses and all the, you know, licensing they need. They um, have these outdoor dining areas on the street, kind of like we saw in COVID, but they just kept doing it because it worked for them. And then they have they have it be a marketplace. Um, so they have like roped off seating section. They have special events. They have hmm. live music. They have a cornhole league that goes all summer. This sounds like what happens in Rhino. Does it? Yeah. So it's just something that's, okay. it's it's really a staple there from, from what I can see from when I've been up there in the warmer months. And then when it gets cold, they, you can drive again, at least like at least one way traffic you can drive. The uh, the winter summer thing is interesting. Like to me, yes. the fact that the permits for the ones in the Rhino are expiring in the winter, when some businesses will be affected like disproportionately versus the summer when there might be you know more good vibes abound. Yeah. Uh, kind of an interesting kind of an interesting choice for the policymakers yeah. on that one. It's very weird to me because it seems like it's really worked for Idaho Springs and they keep doing it, and then just when when the colder months roll around, they just you know pack it up and let people drive through again. I also think this may be an issue of um, pro- programming the street, which is something that, for instance, Larimer, I don't know how it works on farther down on Larimer, but at Larimer Square, they have like an organization that programs it and puts press releases out about it and draws attention to it. And it's sort of like a business improvement district style thing that helps the businesses get the word out. And I wonder if there was something a little bit more formalized and organized for that part of Larimer, if it would help those businesses. They're working on it. That's what some of the supporters are are, are doing. They're wanting to form a nonprofit so they can fund street improvements and like really maximize and emphasize the benefits of the shared street. Yeah, I could see that in the future maybe being a better selling point for some of these businesses. But for the time being, I, I don't know. I see, I see it both ways. Um, I can see it being wonderful to get less cars, but also I understand people got to keep their businesses running. And sometimes that means catering to cars. I was down in Larimer Square last weekend and I hadn't really been down there since it was warm. Oh, and yeah? I felt like they did a really good job for the winter because I was we were talking about this and I was kind of like curious to see how they were going to you know, how a walkable street would be in the winter. But they really, you know, they had all the Christmas lights up. They had like a lot of the businesses had little fire pits and stuff out and Mm -hmm. those warming towers or whatever they are. So it was, it was like very, it didn't feel like I was just standing on a snowy street, like cold outside. It felt like a little, like that place always feels just like a little whimsical walk around area. It still Mm -hmm. felt like that just winterized. So I thought, Hmm. I thought it was nice. Hard to say. So situational too. Like what works on one block might not work on totally. another. Totally. And like we're talking about here, time of year, when it's the busiest, who it's serving, stuff like that. So, well, we'll be watching this because I think they put out a, I think the Rhino, was it the Rhino Art District? Someone put out a survey uh, for all the businesses and, and for people in the community to respond to how they feel about it. So we might see something different um, at the beginning of next year. We should put a link in the show notes. And also, listeners, what do you think? I'd love to know what people think about these shared streets, how they're working, how you think they could work better. Yeah. Uh, leave us a voicemail or text us on the Shared Street Hotline, and you might hear it on the show soon. That number is 720-500-5418. Again, the Shared Street Hotline is open at 720-500-5418. Awesome. Well, it's uh, that time of the show when we share our picks for your weekend. Uh, each of us has prepared personal recommendations. It could be an event, a new restaurant, an old favorite running a special, or anything else we think would be perfect to do this weekend. Uh, Paul, do you want to start? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Miss Peyton, actually. I wish I knew what Peyton would be picking for <laughs> this know. weekend. Um, She's so good at it. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking last few weeks, I've kind of like just been eating a lot of french fries you know it's a new it's a recent obsession you know i I, I like what i like and i started tracking which place makes which type because you know i really like the steak fries but then there's this one type that is like they they has like a little bit of extra breading i think they they wrap the potato sticks in like cornstarch or something you know that style that like extra crispy double battered yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i think it's that so there's a few places i've been to lately that have these i just think people should know if you love these fries like i do you'll want to know gaia masala burger over on uh sixth avenue like south side of capitol hill las tortas fantastic and bull and bush i was there last night they got them all delicious that's my pick for your weekend french fries and i i will say uh bull and bush perfect place if you're a holiday freak like myself their decorations are amazing 
Oh, it's so on point. Oh. I was telling you, last night, it's beautiful. They got lights everywhere. They got a ginormous wreath outside the front door. It's beautiful. They have the bubbly Christmas lights, the old school 50s ones that have a little bit of water in mm-hmm. them that bubble. A little bit warmer. Oh. oh. My mom had those and they, they melted yes, themselves. They, probably they like literally almost lit on fire, so she had to get rid of them. Oh, they're so, it's so cool, but it is such a beautiful bull and bush. One of my favorite spots in the city, ambiance-wise. Good call, Paul. For the fries. Um, fiddlesticks, fiddlesticks in Lakewood also has fries like that. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Olivia, what do you have? The last blank slate show of the year. My friend, my friends, Riley, Am, and Tess, the members of Blank Slate, the band, they're hosting a holiday evening with Blank Slate, The Short Term, and Jay Nessa on December 15th, which is Friday at the Broadway Roxy. And the show is at 9 p.m., uh, tickets in advance are twelve dollars. Um, at the door, they're fifteen. And I'm just this is one of my favorite local bands. Probably now, nah, this is my favorite local band, and I'm just excited to go see my friends play and have their last concert of the year. And they always put on a great show. And the Roxy is really fun. So another another perfect cozy place for the winner. Honestly, yes, ambiance wise is yes. perfect. Great so. for a show too. They have a beautiful stage. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a pretty intimate space, too, so it's a great place to see a band you really love, or it's to me, it's a great place to discover a band because you get to, like, be really close up with them, so maybe go check out Blank Slate. I love that recommendation. I love the Roxy. I always, I always forget what a great venue that is. Good call. Yeah. Check them out. Bree, it's your okay. turn. Okay. <laughs> I'm still on the winter market. Um, I'm still looking for winter markets, still looking for a present. Still shopping in the cold. Still shopping. This one I don't think is going to be cold because I think it's inside. Oh, okay. Uh, this is the Rainbow Dome Winter Solstice Market. Um, this is their first annual Winter Solstice Market. They're going to have 40 different vendors, uh, last minute holiday gifts, all kinds of things. Rainbow Dome is, um, generally speaking, it's sort of a, it's, it started out as like a roller skating, a pop-up roller skating event put on by these two artists that I know, Theron Zimmerman and Frankie Tone. And, um, it's really grown into a community. They do live music during the roller skating and all kinds of stuff, but they're connected to the arts community. So they're doing a market, which makes total sense. And they just, um, acquired a brand new building at 1660 North Federal. So it's going to be inside. And uh, it's also totally accessible, which I love. It's all one floor. It's super easy to get to. And you can support local artists. They're also going to have a drag story time. And uh, they have parasol patrol as well. So if you're coming out to drag story time and you're worried at all about folks harassing you outside, they've got that all set up to keep folks safe. And um, it's just like a really nice, fun family-friendly event, gift wrapping, photo booth, all kinds of stuff. Oh, they're doing skating classes too. So if you do want to get in on the skating and you've never skated before, roller skated, this is a great place to start. What's the venue again? It's so it's an it's an old, I want to say it's an old furniture store. I think it was called Ponce Furniture. It's right by the sports fan store. It's right behind uh, my, uh, behind Empower Field, right on Federal. So it's a building you would probably recognize. It's just it's just like a sort of a 50s strip mall building, but it's this huge, massive space that they've taken over and they're starting to remodel it. And I think this is one of their first events there. So they've not had a permanent space. So this is pretty cool too. So we'll have more recommendations for you in our newsletter, Hey Denver, which you can subscribe to right now at denver.citycast.fm. We've got uh, events in there all week long. We actually just beefed up our events section. So if you're looking for fun stuff to do all weekend, we have a lot of recommendations for you. Um, Paul, Olivia, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the person in line behind you at Panera about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See ya. I know, isn't it nice? American history with Bree Davies. And then you get Canadian history with Paul Caroli. Paul has not given me any Canadian history. Let me tell you about the day that they introduced the $2 coin. <laughs> Olivia. What's it God. called? What's it called? A $2 well, coin. Well, that's the thing. No, 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 no.
up in Canada, there's been a one dollar coin for a long time that famously has a picture of a duck on the it. The loony? So they call it the loony. But in uh, when they introduced the two dollar coin, people were like, "What do we call it?" And then basically everyone said uh, the toonie. Hell yeah! Ah, that's great. As in two loonies. Yeah, it is great. 